Okay, so we are in chapter 23 of the story. I'm going to need my water here. You can tell me what we talked about last week. We talked about the birth of Jesus in August. It's not illegal. Heck, I see uh, Halloween um, decorations going up in town already, so maybe we should start putting up Christmas decorations too. Who knows? Um, yes, yeah, so we talked about the birth, the miraculous birth, and actually we talked about the ways that God presented the introduction of, of Jesus, the, the Messiah, the, the long-awaited, and that Jesus was, Jesus is God's rescue plan for us. Why? Because his upper story, his plan is he wants to be with his people. And so he has to make a way to overcome that which separates us from being together, and that is sin. So there's our simple pictogram of God sending Jesus to become the bridge so that he can live with us and in us. So today we're talking about Jesus getting started in his ministry. Okay, he came as a baby. But as it says in a silly movie, Jesus didn't stay a baby his whole life, right? He grew up, he became a man, but he wasn't always a rabbi. Uh, it wasn't until, until his early 30s that he started his ministry. And so his ministry really begins with his baptism by John the Baptist. Remember that John the Baptist was prophesied uh, as the um, becoming of Elijah, the spirit of Elijah proclaiming the way of the Lord, declaring that God is doing a new thing and getting people to repent and prepare their hearts. But it wasn't only his baptism. In this, we're going to break this down. We're going to see that there were a lot of steps that happened in this chapter 23 um, for Jesus to be prepared for ministry. And those steps, real quickly, as our, as our outline, he had to know his identity, first of all. He had to receive the Holy Spirit because he was fully God and fully man. He had to develop a spiritual discipline of his own. He had to have his faith tested a bit, kind of like what we just talked about. He had to build a team around him, a support group, if you will, uh, also turns into his ministry team. And he had to get outside of his comfort zone. And it's weird for us to think of the fact that Jesus had a comfort zone. Like, there was, there was 30 years of his life where he was fairly anonymous, living quite happily as a carpenter, and then he uh, has to come to gr grips with the fact that he's actually the Son of God and he has a ministry, a purpose to fulfill. So, the baptism of Jesus turned to Matthew chapter 3. That's where most of the uh, readings are going to be from today. And uh, Matthew, so the baptism of Jesus is one of the few stories in, of the Gospels that are recorded in all the Gospels. And I found a cool website this week called the Parallel Gospels. And I've heard of Parallel Bibles before where you see like multiple um, interpretations or translations side by side for each verse. But this was cool because it had four columns and they were literally just the, the Gospel text. And you could see what was Matthew's take, what was Mark's take, what was Luke's take, what was John's take, if they all talked about the same thing. And if not, there was gaps in those sections for those writers. So anyway, recommend that resource, the Parallel Gospels. But this is one of the few things that all four wrote about, so you know it's important. Okay, so listen up. Matthew chapter 3, starting in verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and yet you come to me? And Jesus replied, let it be so, it is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. So then John consented. So this is an interesting question. Why did Jesus need to be baptized? Like, if he really led a sinful life, sinless life, let's make that correction. If he really led a sinless life, then why did he need to be baptized? Was it for the forgiveness of sin? Not necessarily, because he didn't have any. But Jesus says this is proper for us because this was a symbol that they had in their society of being righteous. Amen? Uh, of, of being, and righteous here can be used as being separated for the purpose of God, to be consecrated, 
to show that this is something, uh, a marked point in his life where the old has gone and the new has come. Okay, there's a new part of his life opening up right here. Uh, also to be above reproach, just because, you know, he was a Jew living in a Jewish society and it would have been expected that a Jew would have been baptized from time to time. <laughs> it was a cleansing ritual. It was a cleansing of their sins. I think one of the big reasons is, is because it, it, he wanted to identify or to be identifiable by us, even today, by, by sinners. People who sin, going through a process of coming to the Lord and having this, this process done, this baptism. And, as I said, there's, this was a new phase, a new covenant being created with God's people. And this covenant was built on a repentance of the heart, a circumcision of the heart. Okay, it was no longer about just following the law and, and being circumcised in the body. It was a new thing, a new time. So those are some good reasons that Jesus was baptized. M continue on with verse 16. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of, of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. Now, in Mark, the word where it says it opened, the word is rent, that heaven was rent apart, it was torn apart. And I love that so much more because this was God uh, making a statement to the world, tearing the skies open, and, and, and from that we hear this voice of God getting into the next slide, saying, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. And it's when it says that he saw the Spirit of God that he probably refers to Jesus, but it's as if people, the word saw there was like gazed upon. It was a notable event, this opening of the skies that people gazed upon. So God was making a proclamation, but God was also giving a gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And in this case, it says that the Holy Spirit descended upon him in the form of a dove and it was visible so that everybody could see a dove also being a symbol of peace but in this case of, of, of the Holy Spirit it's himself as a person why was it important for Jesus to receive the Holy Spirit wasn't he already God I think this is very significant because Jesus was a man Jesus was born of a woman, and Jesus had limitations of a man. And so if we, if we assume that all of the miracles and all of the words of knowledge that Jesus had were simply because he was the Son of God and therefore he had access to the special power that we don't have access to, then when Jesus commands us, such as in Matthew 10, 8, to go and heal the sick and cleanse the leper and raise the dead, then it's kind of like, but you had a special power that I don't have. But instead, if Jesus was a man who received the baptism of the Holy Spirit at the same time as this water baptism, now when Jesus commits us, or commissions us to do the same as he did, he said, go and do greater, even greater works than I did. That makes a whole lot more sense now if we have access to that same power because we have access to the same Holy Spirit. Amen? So it is my belief that when we say God, that Jesus was fully man and fully God, that's true. But I believe that Jesus was only able to do godly things because he walked with the Holy Spirit in him. And when that's why it's so significant. Even John the Baptist, if you were to go backwards in chapter 3 just a little bit, John, uh, John the Baptist says first, um, there, I'm baptizing you with water, but there is one who is coming who is going to baptize you with fire and the Holy Spirit. And so John knew that water baptism, although important for our spiritual development, is actually secondary to the importance of spiritual baptism. And Pentecostal churches like ours, we believe that, that baptism of the Holy Spirit is a separate, and it can, be, it can occur at the same time, but is a distinct event where we are filled with the Holy Spirit to the point that we are actually able to fulfill the things that Jesus calls us to do. Amen? Can I get an amen? Anybody out there? All right. Because this is an important distinction to make. 
Jesus did what he did because he had the Holy Spirit. He had the Holy Spirit because God gave it to him. God promised us the same Holy Spirit. Jesus promised us the same Holy Spirit. In fact, Jesus didn't do water baptisms. But it says that when I leave, the Holy Spirit will come. And then he told his disciples, stay and wait for, to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Right? At the time of Pentecost. So, wow. Now, Jesus received his identity also. Verse 17. A voice from heaven said, This is my son whom I love, and with him I am well pleased. <laughs> Jesus had not done anything at this point. Other than the, st the story of him being in the temple and amazing the other uh, scribes and priests with his knowledge and wisdom, he had not done any miracles. You know, 30 years ago there was you know some happenings with some shepherds in a field and some magi from the east, but I'm sure all of that had been forgotten by the people of Galilee. All right? But now God is declaring, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. He had not done anything to receive God's pleasure, to receive his favor. It was merely because of who he was as a son. And that needs to be our mindset as we receive God's love. We're not trying to work for it. We're not trying to earn it. We're not trying to prove God that we're worthy for it. But because we are his sons and daughters, we know that we are loved. We know that we have access to our daddy in heaven. Amen? It also means that when we interface, that's a really bad word, when we, when we uh, parent, when we love, when we deal with our own family, especially our children, we need to have that same attitude of love. It is because they are our children that we love them and nothing more. Not how they did in school, not if they kicked the winning soccer goal, not if they made any points in the basketball game. Love for love's sake, because that's what Jesus does. That's who God is. First John says, God is love. And anyone who does not know God does not love. Also in this short little section we've talked about so far, we also see this idea of the Trinity. We're only three verses in. We're just hitting some major theological points right here. This is awesome. The Trinity is a word that we don't actually see in the Bible directly. Trinity meaning tri-union, the unity of three things. But there are some verses where we like this one where we clearly see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all represented and all fulfilling distinct roles in that passage. So Jesus was being baptized. The Spirit of God was descending as a dove, and the voice of God was booming from heaven. This even made it into Monty Python. <laughs> to see God speaking. So we can, we can point to this verse. We can point to other verses like uh, the other accounts in the Gospels, and especially in Matthew 28, 19, and 20 in the, in the Great Commission, Jesus says, Go into all the nations of the earth and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So G clearly Jesus thought there were three parts of God. Amen? That's a freebie. That's an aside. Trinity is, is debated. Unfortunately, there are denominations that exist purely because they disagree with the Trinity. They say, Jesus alone, right? Or Yahweh only. They're all missing the, some of these scriptures that pull it all together. Fully God and fully man. We already talked about this quite a bit. But there's a verse I didn't bring in yet. Philippians 2.6 and it says that though Jesus was God he did not think of God with, sorry, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Carrying on um, and this is quoting from Isaiah 52 by the way he who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped but emptied himself 
taking the form of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name above all names. So he was God in heaven, and we already studied in John chapter 1 last week that he was instrumental in the creation of everything. Yet Jesus chose to set that aside, his divinity, his rights as God, and come down in the form of a baby, lying in a manger, and being raised up to a man, and ultimately to be killed. He, ch he made that decision to empty himself so that he could come and walk with us and be with us and experience what we experience, our pains, our sorrows, our frustrations, our temptations. And he did it all gladly. It says in another place that it was the joy, that we are the joy set before him as he was carrying his cross. Amen. Oh, I missed a couple of verses. Continue on with um, Philippians 2.10. And that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I had to include that because we ended up talking about that last week. That was kind of off the cuff last week. But um, that Jesus emptied himself, became nothing. And yet there will be a time when he will be everything. And everybody, whether they want to or not, is going to acknowledge the divine nature of Jesus. So, Jesus now had an identity, he had the Holy Spirit with him, and he was ready to go get started, right? Changing the world. Well, if you're going to take on a big task like that, you first need to discipline yourself. You first need to get into a rhythm where you stay connected with God. Because if you go off and try to change the world on your own, you're going to burn out really fast. And so I think that uh, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, it says that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. But I, th I think it was a combination of being led by the Spirit and also gladly going. My belief is that he knew that what was ahead of him was much bigger than he could take at that point in time. And so he had to develop his own spiritual maturity, his own relationship with God, his own understanding of who he was by being separated from the world going up on the mountain, so to speak, as Moses would do, and spending time with the Lord. For 40 days, he was in the desert, fasting, praying, being intentional with his presence with the Lord. And after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Okay, fasting for 40 days, we would say that's crazy. I know, that, I know people have done it, and they've lived, so it's not exactly crazy, and Jesus did it. And we want to be like Jesus. All I'm saying here is that it's okay to be a Jesus freak, to do things that Jesus would do, if you're doing it for the right reasons. And I think that we should take this as an exhortation in our own spiritual discipline of prayer and fasting and time with the Lord. Amen? Interaction is encouraged. Okay. <laughs> Online, you just go ahead and shout it out anytime you feel like you can connect. So, while he was in the desert, the last part of that verse says that when he was hungry, he was tempted. Now, I have um, a series of bullet points here that are kind of like a mini sermon in themselves of spiritual warfare. Because that's what happened in the desert. Is he met spiritual warfare, and he taught us how to deal with spiritual warfare. So maybe we should listen. But I'm going to go through these pretty quick. Okay. So while he was hungry, he was tempted by Satan. Satan is going to attack you while you're weak. Not just physically weak, but also emotionally weak or spiritually weak. If you've been away from the fire of God, the presence of God, if you've been away from corporate worship, if you've been away from time with the Lord, if you've been away from um, uh, reading your, your Bible, then that makes it so easy for the devil to start 
throwing those fiery arrows at you because you're a lone wolf at that point. Or a lone sheep, I should say. You're a lone sheep. He can pick you off and nobody will notice. Right? When you start to have those life-changing events and you don't have someone, a, a, a church family, or someone who is loved and trusted as a, as a spiritual mentor to pray with you and support you and encourage you, then you're just making yourself wide open for the devil's attacks. And we, we see that with people who are going through medical emergencies, life-changing events. You, we, we hear that in words like, I'm so tired. I just can't take it anymore. Why is God doing this to me? Right? Those are like, from our, from a perspective of being spiritual brothers and sisters to them, Christian brothers and sisters, those are our key words that we need to be listening for so that we can come around them and stand in the gap. We talked about that not very long ago when they were rebuilding the wall. Standing in the gap for our brothers and sisters. Hold them up. Give them encouraging words. Love them. Support them. But also, don't make yourself so vulnerable by being far from, from the fire. Just like in the Garden of Eden, when Satan tempted Eve and he said, Did God really say? We see that happening in Matthew 4, 3. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, then tell these stones to become bread. Immediately, questioning what God had just put into his life, his identity, first and foremost, if you really are the Son of God. Don't allow the devil to speak those kind of lies to you. You are the son or daughter of God. If you have accepted Jesus into your life, then you are a daughter of Abraham. You are a part of that covenant promise. And you don't need to uh, question that or allow anybody else to question that. Say, get behind me, Saint Satan. I know who I am. And Jesus answered it. It is written that man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. See, he said the same thing. Sorry, I copied Jesus, I guess. That our answer is already captured in the book of life, in this in this book that gives us life, I should say. The, the Bible has our answer. God's promises are recorded there for us. So he's going to test him in his identity. He's going to test him in his, uh, his faith or his religion, let's say. Um, we see this sometimes within the church. We see this through gossiping. We see this through divisions. We see this through people who have their own motives, agendas, or just want to have a little bit of recognition. Matthew 4, 5, and 6 says, then the devil took him to the holy city and, and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. Isn't that interesting? That the devil took the Son of God to the temple. As if to say, you can have this, although that's coming up next, but as somehow that the devil had dominion there and it was already God's. The devil is not afraid to come and attack you even in the place where you think you should be most secure. Okay? And we see that through our own um, sinning and selfish motives, even inside the church. Okay? We can see that in someone trying to uh, show off in the church, whether it be uh, through an instrument or a performance, or uh, it can even be quoting scripture, or it can be uh, a public word, you know, praying in tongues, all these things that in and of themselves are biblical and true and useful to the teaching of the body. But when used with the wrong motives, when used with selfish motives, they can actually be destructive and, and the Satan can work in that. So in this case, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. And again, Jesus knew the Word of God and, he's, and he said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. I quote that a lot. There's no reason to challenge the Lord. God's already made his promises to you. Just say yes and amen to them. And if we continue to 
ask God to prove himself to us when he's already done so much to do that then it's it's like a mockery of God so then Satan takes him up onto the mountain to the highest point in the area overlooking the city of Jerusalem actually it says showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor now it's kind of true that Satan is the master of this world he is the prince who rules earth wherever the kingdom of God is not okay whenever we have believers who are acting in faith that area is claimed for the Lord that is part of the promised land but outside of those areas the devil is the prince of the air he's the one that's roaming around like a lion he's the one that's tempting and bringing people to destruction right so he says all this I will give you if you bow down and worship me and Jesus responds away from me Satan for it is written worship the Lord that your God and serve him only in all three cases Jesus response was directly from Scripture it is written it is written it is written and that is all the more reason why we need to be students of God's Word and we need to hide those words in his heart in our heart as it says in Psalm 119 so that we may not sin against God so we may not fall subject to this attacks from the enemy and so to respond to the testing of your faith you should pray you should use God's word as a sword as it says in the Ephesians 6 you should command the devil to leave you alone I love that in the scriptures uh, when Jesus was casting out a, a demon he's he commanded them not to speak he didn't give them any room to operate or to take the stage we can do the same in fact in James 4 17 it says resist the devil and he will flee it's like the devil has no room to negotiate with you when you say in the name of Jesus you have no place here do not speak to me you must leave uh, some other verses to support this uh, John 1 4 4 God's spirit who is in you is greater than the devil than he who is in the world so humble yourselves I just read this one humble yourselves before God resist the devil and he will flee from you God's Word is an inseparable weapon Ephesians 6 17 in the same way prayer is essential in this ongoing warfare pray hard pray long pray for your brothers and sisters so we're summarizing here next slide Jesus had a ministry to do and he knew it and maybe he's been putting this off for a while we don't really know but I get from the I get a feeling from his first miracle the wedding in Canaan turning the water to the wine when Mary says hey Jesus you need to step in and do something what does Jesus say my time has not come <laughs> Jesus was maybe dragging his feet a little bit longer or he wanted to but Mary was encouraging him to leave his comfort zone this is my last bullet here Mary was Mary being the mother knows what Jesus is capable of knows where his faith life is at his understanding of who he is and he has to she has to encourage him to step into his ministry step into his destiny of who he is what he needs to do so in, in Matthew 413 it says that um, Jesus left Nazareth he went and lived in Capernaum and the people living in darkness have seen a great light those in Capernaum on those living in the land of the shadow of death a light has dawned and from the time from that time on Jesus began to preach repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near so there was a marked moment in Jesus's life starting with his baptism where he was a carpenter to where he was the Messiah and that was 
I believe not, not only the water baptism, but the spiritual baptism. And so if you have not taken seriously this promise from Jesus about being baptized in the Holy Spirit, then I encourage you to look at those scriptures again, talk with someone who has, and seek prayer. This is a promise that God wants to give us his spiritual gifts through the Holy Spirit for the building up of your soul and for the church, the edification of the church. So I'm going to close for, in prayer and I'm going to pray that for all of us because it never hurts to have more. <laughs> you know, even when we've been baptized by the Holy Spirit, we can kind of stray from that a little bit. We can become a little more focused on the world or ourselves and we need to be reminded and refilled. Paul says continually be being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's an ongoing decision. It's an ongoing invitation. So Father God, I thank you for this example that you have shown us in the life of Jesus who being God himself knew that it was not enough for him just to go and change the world on his own but that he needed the Holy Spirit that he needed time with the Lord, that he needed to develop spiritual disciplines in his own life, that he needed to develop a team that he would go and call to himself to be ministers of the gospel, and that he needed support to be encouraged, to step out in faith, and to do the things that he is called to do. And Lord, if Jesus needed all that, then we know that we need all that too. Lord, we confess that we are not perfect. We confess that we are sinners. We confess that we fall short of your glory. But it is in our weakness that you are found strong. And it's in our messiness that people get to see your glory and your holiness. And so, Lord, for everyone listening, if you would like to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, just pray this with me right now. Father God, I want more of you. Father God, I want everything that your word promises to me. And when you sent John the Baptist and when you sent Jesus, their words promise us this baptism of the Holy Spirit so that we can receive power from on high and so that we can be your witnesses all throughout the earth. Let it begin with me, God. Let it begin with my neighbors, God. Fill me up so that I can be your hands and feet, so that I can continue your mission, your ministry of compassion, of healing, of salvation, of spreading the word and telling people that the kingdom of God is here. Yes, Lord, you are coming again. And yes, we will see the completion of those promises. But even now, the kingdom of God is here when we declare it to be so and we ask you to be a part of our lives. Lord, fill us with that Holy Spirit, God. And Lord, I pray that there would be signs and wonders that would follow. God, I pray that you would confirm your actions, uh, Lord, through, through tongues, through healings, through prophetic words, through words of knowledge. God, I pray that those things would grow in abundance. And God, that people would see those things and know that you are working in a mighty and new way in the McGregor through Active Love Church, through each of us. In Jesus' name, Lord, I pray, I pray, I, I, I want to see more of your working, Lord. I want to see more testimonies come forth, God. I want to see more souls saved through your Holy Spirit working in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, thank you for, oh, Lord, ha. Huh. Everyone online, thank you for joining us. Um, we hope that you'll also reach out to us so that we can um, get to know you more and, and minister to your needs as well and plug you into what we're doing. And we look forward to seeing you again next week. Amen.